transformative power of flat decentralized communities. So we're going to be exploring on management. Um, for those who are interested in following along, if you follow that link that was on the previous page, um, it's also in the chat channel. Uh, you can even get access to this slide deck, so you can skip ahead if you're curious to see to see what's what's there. You can also comment on it. So. Unmanagement, as we mentioned, is a method for creating flat, decentralized communities that self-organize around projects. Uh, it builds on a range of other techniques that are out there, but in its totality, it's something that's new and recently only both possible and needed and originates within the Corona Y community, which Arthur is going to speak to shortly. Here's a basic overview of our agenda. So we're going to go a little bit over our timeline. We'll give a definition of unmanagement, or at least a, a capture of what some of it is. We're going to talk about some of the challenges uh, that we've faced in terms of, of information management and, and generally as Corona Y. Um, and there'll be some interactive exercises built within there. Uh, we'll talk within there also a little bit about the, the underlying principles that we're finding as part of unmanagement. Um, and then we'll we'll share some of the pieces from the the interactive exercises that there have been. Um, there's there's going to be a Q and A period during that same time when people are, are doing interaction, um, and that'll be fairly much <laughs> on principles. I like that, Dimitri. Uh, that's great. Um, and then and then there'll be informal Q and A at the end as well. So we'll start by just doing a, a, a very brief introduction of all of the people who are uh, who are going to be presenting today. So uh, Arthur, why don't you kick us off? So I'm obviously a founder of Corona Y. I'm also uh, an AI expert, and my background is just working in extreme uncertainty, which I think was very helpful to the uh, the phenomenon of Corona Y uh, forming. And I come from a VC environment, venture capital environment, and I, for the past six, seven years, I've been involved with uh, over fifty, from fifty to hundred startups uh, being created and pushed to the market. And Marie? My, yeah, my name is Marie Biarreda. Uh, my background is in uh, first running large engineering organizations and then in education technology. And in both cases, looking at how you can make emergent self-organizing organizations work to empower people and employees rather than institutions. Thanks. And Derek, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Derek Kweiser de Stoccatra. I'm mostly involved in strategy and uh, impact investing, trying to find new solutions to make the system work for many. And I've also done a lot of research on the digital space and anthropology to understand actually what type of new rules might be emerging from that space and how to benefit actually the widest community from it. Thanks. And I'm Daniel Lindenberger. I um, I have a couple of hats. One hat that I wear outside of Corona Y uh, is doing virtual reality development and working with emerging media. Um, I'm acting supervisor out of the University of British Columbia's Emerging Media Lab, um, and we do virtual reality for positive social impact within my own company. The other hat I wear has to do with group dynamics and teaching different governance modes like consensus or sociocracy uh, and doing community building within that kind of a realm. Tyler? Uh, hi, I'm Tyler Parker-Smith. I work in education and special needs most of the time, but I've spent for the last 10 years building online communities around various media needs. So music technology has been most of it, but I've been involved in gaming communities and I've used them sort of them community building skills to build and help organize Corona Wise ever growing community. Perfect. And yes, on. Hello, everyone. I'm Yasun Kostadimidis. I come from physics and economics, but I mostly work in mathematical modeling and uh, data analytics. I joined the Corona Y because uh, from my line of work, uh, I was very interested in how to combine people of different uh, disciplines from different uh, knowledge domains to achieve uh, great results and coordination through decentralized uh, management. Great, thanks. And uh, is Anton here? Anton, yeah, did you want to introduce yourself? We also have generally, and we're mentioning here uh, as part of the presenter, we have a, a few different members of the Corona Y community. And even though we are representing uh, for that community here, um, because it is such a self-organizing piece, 
um, there may be places where other members of the community may may jump into the discussion as well. Um, and we'll we'll just sort of see how that flows. Okay, so for the key goals for this workshop, um, by the end of it, we're hoping you understand the basics of unmanagement and how its principles allow for performance by uh, teams of strangers in fairly uh, unusual and uh, geospatially removed locations. Um, we hope you'll understand the basics for how unmanagement can be applied uh, within a more traditional uh, development environment than the one that we have. Um, and we hope you'll maybe pull a few things out uh, glean a few things that you could use in terms of basic and management principles that can be used within your own organization. And we're, we're delighted to talk with people afterwards more about that as well. Um, to start that off, though, we should talk a little bit about how unmanagement has evolved and how it has been intertwined with Corona-wise growth. So I'll pass things off to Arthur now. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. So um, we'll obviously start from the starting conditions. The, the thing that triggered this whole phenomenon, which was my LinkedIn post, uh, and that was my response um, to the White House call to action for tech community to help with analysis of the scientific uh, literature on COVID-19 or like coronavirus in general. So I took that call to action and formed uh, a call to action of my own with my kind of values and my uh, principles around it, meaning that it's it's about everyone. Like everyone should care about this and everyone like ideally can help, which really resonated and became this attractor. If you're coming from math or physics background, you definitely understand that there is this something that people can start uh, gravitating towards to. And that's what happened. And that's where the timeline uh, kicks off. So we've created uh, a kind of the interactive timeline. You can click on the link and actually explore um, day by day the first uh, major events that happened from the creation of Trello, creation of Slack, the actual kickoff of daily calls. Um, since we operate uh, based on the radical transparency, all the meetings that we're having are being posted on our YouTube channel. And you can retroactively explore how we were actually forming the organization. Okay, uh, and let's talk a little bit about just generally unmanagement, and I'll pass things over to Marie for that. Fantastic. So imagine that you are given a team that is of uh, 50 people, that's then 100 people, that's then 1,000 people. You have three weeks of a deadline, and you're supposed to develop something that's useful for searching literature for COVID-19. How do you do that? obviously not by traditional uh, standard uh, top-down management because there, there isn't enough time to do that. You don't have time to do requirements, definition, and so on down waterfall or agile or whatever you prefer. So the question is, how do you make management happen without the traditional command and control kinds of elements that are typically there? That's what unmanagement is about. It's a set of principles and practices that allow self-organizing emergent organizations to do amazing things without some, anybody uh, setting the direction of saying, this is what we're doing. How that's possible, how this happened here is because we started with a group of people who had this just tremendous uh, belief in and adherence to the principles that this is going to be a bottom-up development. Everybody's going to decide for themselves what they're going to do. We're not going to tell people what to do. And even the goals themselves, the deliverables, what was going to happen was a living, evolving thing that didn't come from somebody specifying it, but from everybody working on it, kind of doing their own thing, and then it kind of emerged from that. That may be hard to believe, it's really counterintuitive, but like with this picture we have here of, of, of Ruben's face, when you first look at it, you either see the vase or you see the two faces. But and, and until then, the other vision is invisible. But once you see it, it's something that you can't unsee. And it really changes the way that uh, people manage. Instead of having a leader that's setting a direction, the vision is set by the whole team. Instead of leaders taking tasks and breaking them down and giving them to people to do, which is an extremely limiting way to develop, you're, I mean, you're basically cutting off 90% uh, of what people are able to contribute. Everybody contributes what they can contribute. All of that's valued and seen. 
And everybody decides day to day using their own judgment how they want to work towards that vision. Instead of taking, having this notion of employee performance that's managed by these HR checklists, you just show everybody what everybody's working on. And I don't know if you've been in these traditional organizations where people fight for these scarce rewards, right? It's like, oh my God, if I don't get this promotion, if I don't get the status, I am not worthwhile. Or if I don't get this power over people, I am not worthwhile. In these organizations, everybody knows they're worthwhile because every contribution is valued, even the ones that don't necessarily get used. And we don't choose leaders in a flat organization. Leaders emerge. Everyone who wants to lead leads. Leads, Leadership is a role, it's a task. It's not a, a status symbol. And so if you lead, it just means that you make something happen and other people choose to join you to make that happen. One thing I do wanna say is that in the details, when you look at the sausage being made, it's messy. It's messy like any organization is messy. There are going to be personality conflicts. There are going to be people who haven't adjusted to this new way of looking stuff. And particularly, if you're new to the organization and you're looking through it still through this hierarchy kind of a lens, you kind of tend to think that um, you aren't being listened to if you aren't given authority or power over other people. And so there are a lot, there'll be some folks who will kind of fight back against that and say, well, this is just, you know, some sort of dictatorship because nobody is telling everybody to do what I want them to do instead of really celebrating that they truly have the freedom to create anything that they want, want to make free or that they want to create. So within unmanagement, instead of having uh, hierarchies, having rules, having processes and procedures, what you have is relationships and people and a shared set of goals that you develop together and a shared way of working together that honors and respects everyone's contributions from the people who are working 24 seven to the ones who just drop in to do a little bit of work. One thing I wanna throw in there as you're, as you're talking about that is that um, because there isn't the, the pressure that's often there for you have to be perfect, you have to show your next supervisor up uh, that what you're doing is perfect enough that you you deserve a promotion. Um, rather, we try to be as transparent as we can about the fact that we're fumbling and that we're figuring it out. And so it's anytime anyone is able to mention like, oh yeah, I, I have to you know, acknowledge that here's a ball that I totally dropped. Um, is someone able to pick that up? Um, that that's actually seen as a positive thing that people are able to, to do that. And so it's, it's, it's a, again, a little bit of a paradigm shift that's, that's needed there. Yeah, and uh, whereas uh, power and uh, status tend to be the traditional stuff that you get, working in this type of an organization, you get things that are not, that, that there's no scarcity. There's an abundance of respect and learning opportunities and opportunities to, uh, to, to show what you know and, and to teach others. It's, 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 it's amazing. Okay, so we look at the uh, next slide. Yeah, so just to, to quickly go over a little bit of structurally what, what it looks like. Um, I'm giving a couple of, of counter examples. So a traditional organization, you have your boss or you have your board who recruits and hires specific people based on the roles that they can fulfill. Um, typically geared towards maximizing the profit to the organization and, and often to those folks who are, who are in that higher tier um, and to the stockholders. Um, and again, here it's, very, it's fairly rigid often in terms of how that's blueprinted. Any movement, um, whether that's vertically or horizontally in the organization, is decided upon by the managers who then tell you, okay, here's, here's where you're going to be moving to next. Um, in Stanford in 2017, and you'll find a link to that in our resources page momentarily, and you'll find it in the slides here, um, in the commentary, uh, a group in Stanford did a bit of research around what they called flash organizations. And these are organizations that can take advantage of crowdsourcing, they can take advantage of pulling together lots of people fairly quickly, but still in a top-down way. And the example that they gave us as a, a sort of template for it um, is the film world where you have very rigidly defined roles. If you're the gaffer on a film, you know exactly what it is that you're gonna be doing. Same for you know makeup or casting. Um, and this allows people to be interchangeable. As, as a new project comes up, those people hop into their positions, do their work, hop out of it. Um, so depersonalization is actually a key part of how it works. You still have a culture, you still have connection and community that's within it, um, but that's just because we're human beings rather than something that's, that, that's quintessential to how the structuring happens. Within unmanagement, um, 
this is more like what the organizational chart you're going to see is. Um, it's organic. Um, it develops as it goes. Um, you have a mission and you have that initial group that sets the pattern for what's going to be happening and helps recruit widely. But the actual projects, the teams, the tasks, all of that evolves organically. Um, and at the heart, it's all about personalization as well. Uh, the more we're able to understand uh, what an individual's gifts are, what their time is, what it is that they're interested in, the more that we can help that person plug into where they choose to go. Uh, so really it's about understanding each other so that we can each operate from a place in empowerment within the organization, uh, which I, I think is a huge feature of it is that what we as humans ideally want is something that is also of benefit to the organization. So there's not a competing set of forces there. Um, here's, here's a graph showing uh, an example of what that looks like in, in practice. So this is the Corona 1i graph of interpersonal interactions within Slack, which is our main hub for discussion. So you'll notice that the interaction patterns are similar. They're organic. Um, it follows the flow that you would see within a, a typical social network rather than what you would see within uh, a corporate uh, discussion channel. Um, and it really is about um, managing the chaos or, or, I mean, really it's, it's designing in complexity theory in the same way that an iterated function system fractal um, can take tremendously different forms like you see here, just from tiny shifts in the parameters telling it how the attractors are working. Uh, so an unmanaged organization is going to be radically differently shaped based off of the tiny tweaks that get made and the personalities and people who come to it. Um, Unlike an IFS fractal, you don't have just that starting set of parameters. Rather, those parameters are constantly being changed and it's in the feedback loop because those changes are being made by the membership, not by a predefined leadership. With that said, uh, you can start from an existing structure, uh, like whatever organizations you're working with, find the points where you can tweak them to add some productive chaos to the work that's going on there. But really, there is no blueprint for how to do on management. Um, there can't ever be a final blueprint or a, a definitive handbook on it, because what it's about is about managing these competing forces that are present um, and trying to allow for the right things to emerge. Um, so it's a paradigm shift from maximizing employee productivity and conformity to policy to staying present as instant to instant as you can to the challenges and opportunities that are in the organizational community, making little adjustments and seeing what the results are and being okay with the fact that you're gonna get it wrong a bunch of the time as well. Um, and and that's, that's par for the course. So it's, it's more like surfing than it is like architecture. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the overall principles and I'll pass that back to Marie. Sure. Uh, so one thing I want to say about this list is that this is not a list that you can follow. This is not a list where you say, if you if I implement these and check them off, then I will have an unmanaged organization. What will most likely happen is that you will have procedures that try to be unmanagement like, but everybody still behaves in a hierarchical way and people are just more frustrated than ever. Uh, I ran an unmanagement organization for over a decade, uh, small, fewer than 100 people, but separate from our uh, corporate headquarters. And in that organization, there was just this, everybody participated. Uh, two thirds of the people were involved in leadership. Everybody had this sense of re relaxation and peace when they were able to come back to our office from the corporate head offices because they weren't participating in politics. They weren't engaging in management as such. It was all uh, very emergent, very self-organizing. And that kind of a feeling, even though when you again, when you see the sausage made, of course there's challenges, but that kind of a feeling is one that you feel in the Corona Y organization. So if you take a look at our lists, things like decisions are made by the contributors, not by a head, that happens. But if you have a mindset, if your mindset hasn't shifted so that you can see that, it feels like somebody is just uh, not listening to you and telling you what to do because nobody is making your idea the one that everybody has to follow. Uh, leadership is no longer one of choosing tasks and deconstructing them and setting the direction and then uh, checking up with everybody to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Instead, you go to the bottom, you synthesize a true north based on where everybody's headed. You articulate that in such a way that everybody can see the direction the organization is headed. And then the organization kind of aligns itself with that. And you also try to understand the status and outcomes of what everybody's doing 
so that you can share that and see when you're going to have something that you, you can release and that that can come out. Uh, leaders are self-selecting. It's about how you behave, not any authority that you have. And the most key thing in order to make uh, all of this work is that all contributions are made visible and all contributions count. If you can't see what everybody's doing, you don't know how it fits with your own work. And if people can't see what you're doing, you don't get that uh, respect, empowerment, and uh, power to make a difference that you're, that you're here for. Uh, if we make, we've made some processes and tools, but they're opt-in. They're not there to make it easy on managements and bean counters. They're there to reduce the burden on people who are contributing. And also, uh, <clears throat> if you're at all familiar with self-determination theory, Self-determination theory was popularized by Dan Pink in his book, Drive, and it talks about intrinsic motivation. What kind of, and, and he asks the question in his TED Talks, why doesn't business do what science says is gonna work? This is about that. This is about supporting intrinsic motivation and it's about doing the things that science says is going to work. And because, because of the, the nature of this and this, those, those principles, the axioms and how you move through them, um, this ends up playing out a lot like uh, like a game and game theory comes in comes into play. So uh, Derek, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yes, Daniel, thank you very much. Yes, given the complexity of the situation, actually the multicity of actors, um, a nice way to conceptualize actually the entire corona-wide dynamic is to look at a game. And a game has a goal. Um, it has certain rules. It has certain players. And given those dynamics, there is some kind of an outcome. So in the case of Corona Y, the goal here is very clear, is actually address a societal health risk, which is COVID-19. Uh, the rules are, as we just discussed, actually with Mary and Daniel, is open sharing, meaning you give actually to the community without really expecting anything in return. You have this concept of benevolent leaders, meaning that actually you lead because you act, because you believe in something, which is higher than you and higher than the community. And then the players come based on their competencies. So initially it was coding, analysis, but then you have marketing, you have strategy, you have storytelling, then actually it's enriching itself in a way which is really fascinating to then achieve the outcome, which is actually a concrete one after all this kind of chaotic, dynamic, multi type of approach, which is actually digital tools, content to address COVID-19. So maybe actually to look at how this is evolving in time, the next slide, um, is a way actually to structure this kind of game dynamic by saying at the beginning you have a phase one, which is actually in March uh, when you have the first people who joined and have actually some type of a viral dynamic going in all directions, trying to understand what is happening, why, how, learning from each other. Then it's getting very fluid, it's ad hoc. But over time, we have actually some clustering occurring around actually what we call those benevolent leaders. Why? Because they have ideas, perspectives, vision, competencies, or network. And this is creating clusters actually with some outcomes. And actually in the phase three, this viral structured dynamics emerge. It's still fluid and dynamic, as you can see, but then actually you have actually group socialization, ex post, as we call it, which is really then linking to those outcomes and eventually to outside uh, actors. So within, within all of this, there are certain challenges that come up. Every organization has its challenges and every organizational structure does. These are some of the key challenges that we've identified so far within Corona Y that we're, we're facing. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about each one and some of the stuff that we're, we're discovering around them. Uh, so Tyler, do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, routing, uh, sort of the active mode of routing? I'll just give a moment. Tyler. Well, I can talk a little. Oh, yeah. there we go. Yeah. Are you just muted, Tyler? I think he is. Sorry, no? I had my I inter I internally mic'd me muted my mic as well. Sorry. Um so yes, one of the major problems we've had, we've had in Corona Y, and the reason why I've kind of got to this position is is because 
at first it was really chaotic and complicated and anytime new people arrived it was just overwhelming it's overwhelming to try and understand where they can contribute there's so many moving parts there's so much complexity there's so much like no one's running anything and the side effect of that is is i started spending more time trying to understand what oh well that team's doing this this team's doing that and i tried tried to start understanding that and then i started to try and understand the people and it was the human con con it was the human connection of trying to understand what people are interested in and where we where their interests align with problems that the organization has or what we were starting to find and that's the, the sort of it was became this constant everyday dynamic of trying to work out who these new people what do they want wh what are they here for how can they help because absolutely every time someone turns up i'm I, i'm always like amazed when people turn up and i'm always like really appreciative of anyone's effort because it is you know not, not most people in most organizations don't turn up and don't you know don't run towards a problem and the people who are turning up i've defined it's like terry pratchett describes them as witches people who, so, who run towards problems when they see them rather than looking for someone to tell them what to do to solve they, they're just like I don't know what I will do when I arrive at this problem, but I can't ignore it. I need to walk towards it and I will do whatever I can when I arrive. And when I arrived, I saw chaos and I was like, I can't code, but I can talk to people. I can help people talk to each other. And that's what I've sort of been doing since then. Um, when from that, the, probably the next slide will be more about like, We've, tr we've we've that was my active side of it and people have built tried to build like flow charts to try and break down where people go or where is good for your skill set and honestly anytime one of these gets built it's nearly as out of date out of date as fast as it gets made <laughs> like t time in corona y is not is not paced in a normal way it's like within a week things can be not accurate anymore or 10 things have had the names changed and and it's about that or like three new teams have sprung up because they've they've come up with a new problem and they want to concentrate on this and it's it's a really engaging interesting problem to be part of but also yeah you've got to have a very high tolerance to chaos you've got a very very high tolerance to like instability and and you've and the, and I want to try and make it as easy as possible for the people who have a low time threshold to understand the whole of it so I spend a lot of my time trying to simplify as much as I can, but there's a number of, you know, the community engagement team are trying to s build processes into this. But it's, a, it's been a really interesting challenge. It has been a really interesting challenge and I've, um, I've enjoyed it, but it's, it, it's like every day is a new day and every day has got new challenges and, you know, one piece of press and 500, 400 people turn up in a week and you're just like, I don't, I don't know what to do with these people. I can't, I, where do I send them? How can I help them? How can I keep them engaged? Because they ran towards the problem. Now, where can I put that energy into something useful? So that's kind and of- And um, it's, it's interesting because we, we have that, um, we have a lot of, of system thinkers and coders and such. So we kept on, frequently we would try to return to this passive mode and say like, okay, like what's the, what's the passive system that we can set up that will allow people to plug themselves in well? And we've had some success with that, but really what it keeps coming back to is that personal, contact. And if, um, I think Ty Tyler's too modest to say it himself, but Tyler does an extraordinary job of, he is just in every single corner of Corona Y, understanding what the teams are working on, what's going on, watching the, the YouTube videos of the daily meetings that happen and such. So he really understands probably more than anyone, what is going on as a whole organism within it. And that allows him when he talks to people at the beginning to have that personal conversation with them, see what they're interested in, and then be able to be like, hey, well, you may want to go talk to like Maya or Dan might be the right people for you to talk to to plug into your interests and your skill set. Um, and we've had many people say that just that initial piece of personal contact with somebody is what has kept them there and has kept the, and has gotten them plugged in in the right way. And I really want to highlight one of the things Tyler said there around the, that piece um, I mean, it's people who run towards the problem rather than look for leadership and guidance on what to do with it. And of course, that's what in any organization, the more you're able to maximize that among your, your team, the better that's going to be. Um, and because this, this piece around personalization, empowerment of people, and letting them have a bit more say over what it is that they're doing and bringing their own ideas and genius into things, um, that's a key part of how you develop a community of people who run towards the problem because they feel like they can and because they feel like it's going to be appreciated when they do.
Yeah, I mean, what you just talked about, the fact we I've discussed with a number of people within Corona Y that we are all cursed with the imposter syndrome. And it's not because when we're bad or incapable, it's because we're surrounded by so many amazing people who are doing so many amazing things. And, and, and it's not because that person happens to be a professor or that person happens to be an expert coder. We've got teenagers who are turning up and being amazing. And they're being amazing because we're allowing them to be amazing and, yeah. and, we, and, we, and we're going, you know what, you're amazing. Keep doing whatever you're doing because you're just a, a, an awesome human being. And it doesn't matter where you come from, what, what, you know, what point of view, what part of the world you come from. If you turn up and you want to run towards that problem, you know, you, you just want to join. You don't want to join into our group and we'll have you every day because if, if, even if we can't find something else, something specific for you to do right now, having them conversations, putting your two, putting your two pence in, putting your, adding to the conversation, adding your perspective, putting your point of view across is just as empowerful as the person who is building the tool or is building because it's about including lots of perspectives and no one can carry that in their head. I mean, Daniel says, I've got a good idea what's going on and I've got a cursory understanding of a lot of things, but I spend most of my time trying to read and understand more because I'm constantly outclassed in every discipline and understanding. <laughs> but, you know, we can only try. And that's, I, I, I think that's the thing I've only, uh, I've had that skill and that knowledge and that personality from my entire life is I run towards a problem and I don't know what I'm going to do and I don't have any knowledge how to fix it, but I'll try. And that's all. I what, do. what, what, one thing else that I just want to underscore that, that you put there is that piece around um, it's, it's, it's around appreciating the people. We have people who like, are, whether they're a high school student or whoever they might be, that because we aren't fiercely defending our own territory and saying like, no, that's, that's my position. We don't have to justify why we're a part of the organization. We don't have to justify a budget for our team. It means that when we see somebody who's doing something extraordinary, rather than people getting defensive about that, like, that's awesome. Like, look at this cool tool that Anson just developed. Uh, like, Anson, do you, do you need a team? Do you need more people around you who can, who can help make you able to do more cool stuff? And that really, that energy, figuring out how to bring that into organizations can be tricky. Um, but but is able to just incredibly ramp up the degree to which people can do that running towards the problem piece. Um, yeah, so some, some basic rooting on management principles that are here um, are letting people choose their own teams, their own hours, and what they work on. People are fully empowered to make those choices on their own. Uh, you can help narrow the choices based on the relevancy, what are the fit in terms of team needs. Um, you can minimize the burden on the existing team members in terms of how you do the orientation, helping make it so people can come on at, uh, at speed when they join a team. Um, and empowering anybody to start a new project or to grow a team around it. It's not just about joining the teams that exist. Um, and really making sure that at every opportunity that's there, there's some kind of choice. Um, and that, that empowers people to create the environment and the culture of trust that we need for something like a management to really exist and work. And I'll hand things back over to Marie now. You're muted there, Marie. I just unmuted. Great. Okay, everybody. Um, so we want to give everybody a sense of what it feels like, instead of just having us tell you what it's like to be part of an unmanagement organization. And so I just put into the chat again, a link to our document of links. And if you go to the document of links, you will find that there that the first link that we or the second link that we take you to is one called you try it interactive exercise so please go to that document i'm going to give everybody a second to show up here and what we're really looking for everybody to do is now help us with our problem of routing. How do we do a better job of uh, addressing the questions that we have around the, the routing problem? And we've listed some bullet points here, things like what can be done to make it better for us? How do we get people to the right place? Here's a really tricky one. How do we find a place both for the people who are like us who jump into something ambiguous, but if we wanna be inclusive, how do we also make it possible for people to participate who prefer to contribute by just working on a single defined task? How do we find volunteers interest level of interest and engagement? How do we deal with the hundreds of 
participants who don't see how to contribute immediately. How do we address existing contributors who want to find a new task? Um, and then as you develop the solution, check in with some of the unmanagement principles and see, is it fair? Does it bias towards bottom-up decision-making? Does it relieve burdens from contributors rather than creating new ones? Uh, is it opt-in versus mandatory? And can we make sure that we don't end up with a, with a closed system? So uh, feel free to either add text inside this document, use this document to kind of create some of these solutions, use comments if you want to as a, as a chat mechanism, uh, whatever works for you, uh, and just like in the real Corona, uh, why uh, you don't get to stop doing your day job. We will continue with the presentation as we do this work in parallel. So uh, go ahead and I'll be in the document here with you guys. Okay, there we go. So as we continue, we'll talk about some of the other challenges that we've run into. And I'll quickly say for those who do decide to work on that interactive exercise, which I would encourage, um, notice how you're applying those on management principles within your team um, and how you can make sure you're honoring the different people and you're bringing out everybody and making sure everyone's kind of empowered to be participating. The next piece we're going to talk about is um, around the challenge around engagement. So really, we've noticed that it's all about, especially in a volunteer organization like ours, it's all about spark. You get sparked by someone else that's there and what they're doing, and all of a sudden, uh, something interesting is happening. Um, really having that contagion of interest and inspiration is a key part of, uh, of, of what it's all about. So once we succeed in uh, so one area that, we are, that we've been pretty good at in Corona Light is that inspiration-driven work. We find ways to share our enthusiasm. Uh, we have uh, a channel where people can be talking about what it is that they're up to. And we have a channel where people can be talking about their motivation and what brings them to work at Corona Y. Uh, and it's, it's, it's exciting reading through what, what brings those people there. So the spark is catchy. And some of our members have, have ended up pulling whole groups of their own communities into Corona Y because of how exciting they've found it. Within another organization, it might be possible to have a group experimenting with on management, and you'd want to foster that same uh, feel so that people were uh, recruiting other members of the organization to participate in the experiment that's going on. It's, it really is all about that inspiration piece. One of the challenges that's there around engagement is getting people plugged in. People um, land in our Slack channel, and especially right at the beginning, where they would just be thrown straight into it. Um, and it's chaos. You have hundreds of people chatting about different ideas, different things that might be done. Things It's hard to even tell what's on topic and what's off topic. Um, and often it will be people who, you know, Tyler mentioned the imposter syndrome piece. It can be people who are very heavy hitters in whatever their respective fields are. And it can be very intimidating to step into that fray and to start to feel like you're allowed to to participate and that you're empowered to say, well, actually, I think I think this might be a better way to go, or here's an idea of something that we could do. Um, so it can be intimidating and confusing for people to figure out where they want to focus, what teams to talk to, what they want to work on, and what role they're going to take. Um, and understanding the options that are even there can be hard. So part of what we did at the beginning was have multiple stages of onboarding. So initially we have the website, which gives people a sense of what it is that we're doing, and then they join via a form. Um, then, uh, yeah, great, uh, Agnes is making some great comments there in the, uh, in the, the text. Uh, then it's about reading the orientation manual, which right now is woefully out of date, but tries to be a capture of what's the culture and where are the first places people can go based off of their skill sets. So if someone is working on code, they know where to go. If, if graphic design is their piece, they know who they might want to talk to first. Then they give an introduction to themselves, and this gives them a chance to advertise who they are, their interests, their skills, and to say hello and start going in, in the conversational mode, which really is, is such a dominant piece of how everything happens within Corona Y. And then finally, uh, from that introduction is people contacting you, uh, and those tend to be threaded conversations based off of the introduction where people will will greet you, they'll mention the similarities that they found in terms of the areas of interest or skill set, they'll introduce you to other people or tell you here's a team who you might want to talk to or here's a person you might want to talk to. Um, 
all of these steps put together still leave a lot of people unsure of where they fit in uh, and without the confidence to figure out on their own how to participate meaningfully. Uh, so that's a current challenge that we still absolutely have around engagement. Um, we have a large volunteer group, um, which is kind of like an onion in terms of the layers of activity. And we're trying to figure out how to help people shift over to feeling more, more empowered. Um, we know personal contact is key, um, but we're still trying to figure out how to do that within, within Corona Y. Another piece is succession. Because everybody's working on their own time um, and choosing what the things they're working on are, um, it can be really hard to know whose ball, who has a given ball um, and when is it getting passed along or when is it getting dropped or when is it getting worked on. Uh, so that's another challenge we have is trying to find a better way to identify when a person or a task has stopped moving for a little while to check on why. Um, and to identify people's level of engagement and understand why the engagement is what it is. We've had a couple of times where what we've done is just cycle through and get in touch with everybody who has given, you know, has been somewhat involved in the Slack channels just to see how things are. And the key part there again is on that personalization rather than depersonalization. The goal in that contact isn't to say, hey, I haven't seen the, the report or a code push in a long while on such and such. When is that going to happen or what's the problem? It's usually to say like, how are you doing? Are you okay? Um, we haven't noticed, we haven't seen you around as much in the last little while. Um, and often there's some amazing conversations that come out of that. Um, times being what they are, there's a lot of different crises that people are facing. And rather than telling people to sort of leave that at the door, we'll, we'll have one-on-one -on -one conversation and discuss those pieces. Uh, people feel heard, people feel seen. And when they do, that allows them to either step in or to realize that they need to pass a ball on and to, to let us know what are the tasks that, that needs to be uh, moved to someone else um, or that need to be let go of. Um, but again, it can be, it can be lossy. It's, it's sometimes it's hard to know um, where those pieces are and some balls lay dormant for a long while. Um, it can also be lossy in terms of training. We, for some of the teams especially, it can take a while to get people up to speed to work on that team. And then uh, they may they may disappear. So that's another thing we're, we're trying to figure out is how to do that onboarding gracefully and how to make sure that we can retain the people who are uh, who working on on those that, specific that areas. Goes to our, like that. Um, that goes to our like problems around knowledge management, and which I know we're going to get to. But if we had a more extrinsic method to store the knowledge that people acquire it would be easier to transfer that knowledge but it still goes to the fact that knowledge is easier to store but skills are still hard to learn you can't speed someone's skill acquisition up you can give them all the information they need but it's the difference between all the information they need and the ability to use that information in a skillful way and that's the the slow bit of it all but yeah checking in on people is really important as well and, and and that's actually a great invitation. This is a good example for anyone. If someone out there who, who you know, this is your area, this is what you do, um, you might dive in and you may be able to tell us whether it's on this conference in the Google Doc or whether it's later by, by joining um, and see what the actual process is of someone coming in with an idea and how that then forms into something that gets gets acted upon within within the organization. So it's basic management principles that are here. Um, value everyone. Um, to, to model and facilitate actively, people sharing their excitement and inspiration, check in to see where people are, um, being respectful of people's time commitments and their other time commitments and how those vary over time for people. Um, and try your best to help people find a fit where they're empowered to choose, but you can help give them suggestions of where it is they may wanna go. Um, for the knowledge management piece, um, there are a few different challenges that we've been looking at, and I'm just going to go over a couple of them briefly because I want to make sure that we don't skimp on the other parts of the uh, of the presentation as well. One aspect of it is finding the right tools. Um, we have a lot of different kinds of data types to manage, um, different approaches and practices that the different people who come are familiar with. Again, we, we're drawing people, as you'll see, just from who we have presenting, from such a wide range of different disciplines and different backgrounds. So finding the right tools to collectively use to create document and propagate knowledge within and across teams is a challenge. Currently for us, Slack is the backbone. We use that for all of our ideation and conversation generally. Um, Trello is used for identifying and managing the different project tasks, and that's used in varying ways with different teams. We use Google Docs and spreadsheets to group source items and to co-author documentation. 
um, or specific letters, say, that have to go out. And then we use Zoom to have conversations. So a lot of the ideation and conversation, if it's real time, happens on Zoom. Also, on the non-real time side, that becomes a handy repository, which people, especially like Arthur, who has to work about 40 hours a day, can go in and watch some of those daily calls that happen at double speed for the different teams to pick up quickly on what's going on there. Um, Another one of the issues related to that is transcription. We often will have knowledge uh, aggregating in a certain channel, like in Slack, because that's our primary area of discussion. And it can be a challenge figuring out how do we peel that out and get it into the places where it can be stored and retrieved and searched um, accurately, whether that's just a Trello task, a spreadsheet, or a CMS row. Um, Sometimes we've had people sweep through the channels to collect items and put them into places. Other times we simply ask the question. Um, but moving things from that short-term memory of chat systems into long-term memory um, is something that we're still working on and figuring it out. And another piece that's there is around taking the understanding and, and the tacit knowledge that people have um, versus the explicit knowledge and figuring out how do you surface the tacit knowledge in a way that better informs the entire group um, and makes it also so succession planning is, is more functional. Um, in a traditional uh, de in de development environment or a traditional organization, um, this has a, a huge um, implication as well. Um, every organization has its formal channels and its informal channels. And then there's what's in theory done with those channels and then in practice what actually happens. And the more an organization is able to figure out how to identify what those channels are, not necessarily always capture what the information that's in there is. Sometimes some channels work best, like the water cooler channel, when they aren't necessarily being captured, but are simply an opportunity for people to have the discussion they need to have. Um, and where capturing it can actually prevent the needed communication from happening. But finding what the channels are and figuring out how to maximize the ways those channels are being used beneficially um, is a key thing. And any organization can do an assessment of that. Um, and figuring out how much lossiness is there in moving the knowledge that's there from one channel into another. So some overall unmanagement principles that are there around knowledge management is to make it easy to find and know what you don't know. We use um, data visualization and graphics frequently to do that so that we can, as a group, look at and try to understand what's going on. Make it easy to discover what's being done and what isn't. Um, and to not overload with information, to try to optimize for relevancy and time. And what that looks like is gonna be different for each person. So have multiple modes that people can use to access the information that they need and to drill down as far as they need to. And again, the key part is identifying who needs what and when. Um, and that, that personal side, you know, that work of Tyler um, and folks who are working in that same mode is key. I'll just quickly say before moving on to talking about uh, culture, that a part of that is also it all depends on the people you have. Because it's personalized, your organization, if you use on management, is gonna to find totally different solutions than we do. If your organization doesn't have a Tyler, um, then you're gonna have a different approach to trying to figure out how do we know what's going on in all the corners of the organization and plug people into that. Um, that's what's worked for us, but really it's about being present to what your organization's gifts are, specifically within the people that are there, and then working with those. Um, Let's move on to talking about culture, and I'll pass things back over to uh, Marie. All right, thanks so much, Daniel. Uh, so the interesting thing about culture in um, uh, a flat organization like Corona Y is that it is not a goal that is pursued. It is not something that we see as a set of rigid rules. It is a side effect of the values, beliefs, and interests of the people who are participating. Uh, it works in such a way that it really supports intrinsic motivation that, and by intrinsic, by intrinsic motivation, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with motivation, there's five levels. Uh, the, most, the, the lowest level one is where you're motivated by rewards and punishments. That has been found to uh, to be very, very counterproductive. And so if you are uh, managing your organization by promising raises and bonuses or by uh, having people fear for their jobs, then you are not going to have an organization that is very creative or thinking at a very high level. It works fine if you're just doing rote work, 
but it doesn't work if any creativity is at, at whatsoever is involved. And then on the other end is intrinsic motivation, where people literally work for the joy of doing the work itself. It's when people are in a state of flow, and I'm sure we've all experienced that at one time or another, where time just falls away, and it's like you're part of the work, and you don't even realize what you're doing, and you wake up eight hours later, later and go, oh my God, look at this, this is amazing. Um, there are three key components to allowing intrinsic motivation to exist. You can't make it happen. You can just increase the odds that it will. And you do that by making it so that people have a lot of autonomy. In order to have autonomy, that's things like choosing who you work with, what you work on, when you work on it. Uh, and uh, in, in Corona Y, that is taken to an absolute extreme. People can work on anything they want. If they choose something that is really off the rest of the beaten track, like you decided to make donuts instead of uh, use machine language, it probably isn't going to show up as a very strong signal when you look at the high level, uh, what is the vision and direction. But nobody's going to say, no, you can't do it. The other part is competence. If you, have, if you are working on a project, you have the skills that you are able to do, and even better, if it's one that helps you to grow and improve your skills, that puts you uh, in a very strong position to be able to achieve flow. And finally, the relational part. Not, it's partly the community that you're part of, partly how you relate to the vision, partly how, what, why it is this, this work is important to you. If all those three pieces are in place, people are there intrinsically motivated and, they're, and you don't have to start to try to rely on the carrot and the stick to make things happen. And the reason that happened here is because of this ruthless dedication of the founders. They wanted it to be bottom up. They wanted it to be transparent. They didn't want to be boss of anybody and they didn't want anybody else to be boss of anybody. And so there's still some challenge there though that still kind of remain like, and every organization is going to have some things that in corners and pieces that aren't quite right, where the culture isn't exactly right, where we have blind spots. Even when you have the right attitude, belief, desire, we're still gonna have blind spots. How do we see those? And I think part of that is being able to have model honesty and transparency to the point where people actually start to feel comfortable talking about things that are going wrong who once they see they're being taken seriously and that those things are being addressed as best as possible, then everybody starts to become a mirror that we can see our blind spots in. And that's that's an awesome, that's, a, that's an amazing spot. Um, and then we also need to be able to be uh, intellectually honest enough to know the difference between what is a true blind spot of something going wrong versus what is just us having different styles, not understanding each other. We need to be open to each other. And when you first join an organization like this, you can't see that. You don't believe it. It doesn't look like what it really is. But what we've found is that over time, the more time people spend in the community, the more they're willing to um, have faith, if you will. And so they're willing to, uh, to speak up when something is wrong. They're willing to point out better ways to do things. And they're willing to think uh, very critically on their own judgments when they try to figure out uh, what, necessary, what is necessary to be addressed uh, in, in the organization. And even in a non-flat organization, in a regular organization, there are a lot of unmanagement benefits that you can, you can have. You can start by getting rid of the scarce rewards, right? As long as everybody's being paid a fair wage, don't use titles and promotions and bonuses to reward people because it'll, it'll backfire. It backfires every time. Uh, instead, implement ways for everybody's work to be seen and for everybody to be respected. Be sure to recognize all contributions. When I was a brand new manager, we, had, we were trying to uh, promote uh, some, some people to the next level. And they talk, talked about this one woman. They said, well, you know, she just doesn't speak up in meetings. And if she doesn't speak up in meetings, she's not contributing enough. And I suggested, well, perhaps her way of talking one-on-one -on -one people behind the scenes is just as effective, even though it isn't uh, in the style that, you know, this traditional white male culture has, has grown out of. And everybody was open to that. And they said, oh, well, that's right, that's logical, and continued to use that as, as a way, uh, or that approach as a way to look at where are the blind spots, how do we continue to, to, to avoid them. Um, this culture is human, it's inclusive, it's very counterintuitive, it's very agentic, 
it's resilient, it's self-repairing. When it sees a blind spot, it goes and deals with it. And it removes the uh, artificial rewards that are scarce and replaces them with abundant rewards that are authentic and genuine. One thing I want to toss on there that I think is key is that the role of pointing out the blind spots is also different because often um, in a traditional organization, um, you point out the blind spot and it's saying like, here, management, here's the thing that needs to get fixed. Fix that, please. Um, and often at Corona Y, the answer is like, yes, you're totally right. We absolutely need to deal with that. Help. Um, and it's something where really people have to be empowered to help with it because everybody's typically working at capacity as well. But naming and acknowledging and moving into a culture where that can happen frequently um, is, is so key. What allows that um, in part is what we're gonna be talking about next, which is this piece around transparency and trust and vulnerability. So uh, Archer, I'll hand things over to you and Tyler. Yeah, sure. So transparency is hard as a concept. And I've started this community with radical transparency in mind which is not a novel concept at all, has been explored by many companies and individuals like Ray Dalio was his hedge fund, Bridgewater Associates, that operates on the full radical transparency. But there is a difference between uh, being transparent internally and being transparent externally, being vulnerable to external forces. And we, we started with uploading every single meeting, call, chat to our YouTube, but then we realized that other companies, partners, organizations may not be able to do the same because some data is proprietary, some relationships are confidential, some partnerships are confidential, uh, confidential and things like that. So it's, it's just a, a constant balance between being radically transparent internally and externally. And I will pass it to Tyler to talk about uh, a bit more about this from his perspective. Tyler, you're muted. I keep muting my own mic to make sure I don't pick up too much noise. Anyway, um, and this is this this idea comes from the the discussion we've just had about culture. It's like this is what builds culture for me. Culture is built with trust and with transparency. Transparency feeds trust because people can see, and they can understand, and they can believe rather than rather than just, you know, you, this is what you are. It's the, um, Semco is a really prime example of where I first learned about this in an in industrial sort of say place. Ricardo Semler basically made his, put his um, account books for the company completely open. Everyone could see how much everyone earned. And the side effect of that is when the company was struggling or when it was suffering, everyone understood that everyone could give up a little bit and they could they didn't have to have redundancies they didn't have to get rid of capable people who had families and it, it built a community that looked after itself and it looked after each other and it was much more resilient because of it and that is the exact same sort of idea i take from this is like Every, for, for me, Corona Y is like a city. You can't kill a city. It's impossible to do so. The only way you can kill a city is wipe it off the map. And even the ones that have been wiped off the map have never actually completely died because cities are organic organisms built out of people. And if everyone agrees that this city is called this, even if it's moved, it's still that city. It is Corona Y could move all around the world and have completely none of the same people, but it could still be Corona Y because it could still have the ethics, the principles and the, co and the concept of it and it could still live on. And it's that's one of the things that um, builds anything like this. It, we've got to trust each other and it's really hard to trust. It is, it's really hard to just assume the goodness of people. And there has been occasions where we've, you know, people have come in with motivations that are not truly aligned with the, the system. But the difference is transparency reveals that very quickly. And yeah, it reveals, and the it re it reveals that very much about very quickly. And I think Arta wants to discuss on this sort of idea a little bit more. Yeah, and at first I thought there is kind of like this uh, balance between trust and vulnerability. And that's how I at least was managing it in my mind. I would jump on calls and just tell everyone that I'm wrong. I have no idea what I'm doing. And just like, please correct me. And like, just being as vulnerable as possible. Just even just telling about my life, you know, the challenges that I'm experiencing, you know, lack of sleep, lack of food, 
constant stress and all of these things. But then I realized that trust is vulnerability and vulnerability is trust in a way. And there is this uh, great uh, quote from uh, Annette Bayer, uh, who is a, a philosopher from New Zealand. And she says that vulnerability of trust is explained as disposition of the truster to accept the risk to be intentionally betrayed by the trustee. And the next slide is another quote of hers, which is very hard to actually like read and understand. So I'll let uh, you know people digest it on their own. But it comes from a book called Trust and Anti-Trust. Uh, and it's really a great piece to understand how these things are interconnected and are in a way the same thing. And for people to build community like we did or organization that is built on trust, it's important to understand that you know the reason why we're dedicating so much here about the trust is because it's impossible to define a true vision of organization without trust function. So let's ask ourselves, what is a true north of organization? Does it comprise of purposes of individuals? Is that true nowadays? Shouldn't it be that way? But of course, the first thing that comes to your mind is this principal agent problem or an agency dilemma where people act on behalf of their self-interest versus interest of organization. So there are two ways to ask this question. Uh, first one is management question, asking what is a functional objective of each individual in organization? Uh, treat it as a thing, you know, money or something else. But I would actually like to present a dichotomy here and jump to math as a much better framework to explain certain behaviors. And uh, brace yourself, this is kind of like a complex explanation, but it makes sense. And instead of asking what is a functional objective, a thing, Let's ask what is an objective function, an actual relation between things. And here's a good illustration of a three-dimensional vector space where there are different objective functions and functional objectives. And I know it sounds confusing, so let's just try to jump away from mathematical word salad for a minute and jump into real world examples that make it easy to understand uh, when looking at this illustration. Some people want to make money. Some people want to venture and climb mountains like Everest or Kilimanjaro, you know, the red peaks here on the, on the picture. And some people want to explore the bottom of the ocean, the deep blue dip. And everyone has objective functions and some are in a search for one, which is also important. They need guidance and support to find a team of like-minded individuals and some structured direction. So be it Heracles and his labors that were given to him, or Babel Tower, a tower, be it Jason and the search of Golden Fleece or Endless Odyssey journey, like all of that has an objective function in mind. And guess what? Like whenever people unite around one function, it makes it so easy. It maximizes the probability of reaching that, that goal. If you're pushing a really, really big stone up the mountain, you have to unite around that person purpose because otherwise it, it's going to be impossible. And there are different reasons about why people are joining organizations like Corona Y. It's easy to unite when the objective functions are clear and aligned and very hard when objective functions are unknown and pull you in different directions. And leaders of such unmanagement organizations should be aware that there will be individuals that join with a very well-defined purpose that can be completely opposite to the purpose that you're exploring. Values, the principles of organization, like instead of climbing a mountain, they would go to a deep ocean. So we were quite naive to think that we won't have any of such you know, malicious actors, but we were wrong. We've had people that were trying to push conspiracy theories, recruit or steal people out of the community, push us into wrong directions. It's, it's natural, it's something to, be, to expect. And I will pass slides to Derek to speak about it in a more practical terms uh, through the prism of socio-economical model. Thank you, Arta. Yes, um, complexity, uh, you need to put your mind around it. And one way to do it is actually what Marshall Salins, um, an anthropologist with his book, uh, Stone Age Economics actually has put forward in saying that most communities are driven by the way they address their needs and to do so they use mechanism of reciprocity so what we've talking, spoken to about today is about actually this higher purpose where you 
share openly to community to strengthen that community and to build resilience, trust and security. But uh, over time, uh, other types of mechanism emerge. Uh, barter, where you go to a market and you exchange at the right place, right time, actually a good a service. Or later on, the monetary system, where actually what you do is exchange a, a service or product for money, which then you can bring to the next transaction. But what's really interesting here is that each of those mechanisms actually drives different type of behavior and expectations. And uh, one way to look at it is actually to, to understand actually how certain communities and models actually have emerged in the digital space. So here you can see Amazon, for example, actually emerged 25 years ago because they had that patent about actually the one-click purchase. Efficient, little frictions, and less costs. So, of course, they actually build market share. It took time. It was, let's say, not profitable at the beginning, but look uh, where they are today. Second, Facebook. Uh, we all think about advertising and actually the way the business model is structured. But initially, what is it? It's really an exchange between your private data and the ability to use their social tools, actually to build your own network and then build your own brand and exchange views, experiences, pictures, and beyond. And then later on, when they have those private data, they can build the actually uh, advertising-driven model. But now, Corona, why? What is it? What have we spoken about today? It's about trust. It's about openness. It's about a gift. And that gift is really to bring security to the community by addressing a higher purpose. And this higher purpose today is health. It could be something else later on. But it, it, we think it's really important to step back and try to understand actually what are the true motives, incentives, actually, and in how we can actually first keep what has been achieved and then leverage it to then actually bring security purpose to the wider community. So I think Mary is due. Okay. Uh, unmanagement principles. So we've listed a few of them here. Um, again, these are these principles, to be really clear, they're not a checklist. You can't set out a goal to make your culture be human. You have to be human, and then your culture will, will reflect that. Um, some of the things that, that ended up being true for us is that we never gave anybody any uh, grief for not waiting for permission. Right, but but, we, but people would come in and they might not get started because they're waiting for permission. But anybody who knew to jump in and just do something, nobody said you didn't have permission for that. Nobody uh, felt like they needed to ask for forgiveness because everybody all applauded all new work that was done. And because everybody gets to work on what they want to, one of the effects of that is that you may be reinventing the wheel. You may have two or more solutions to a given thing. And in, in this culture, that's okay. It's not wasted work because our goal is not efficiency. Our goal is to figure out how to create something out of nothing. And some of that work that emerges will be part of the final solution. Some of it won't, but that doesn't make any make one of them more valuable than the other or a contribution more valuable to the other. So these elements of, uh, again, of uh, unmanagement principles are things that are critical uh, that we have seen out of Corona Y. But they're not things that we suggest you go in and necessarily try to replicate. And Derek, if you want to talk a bit about the socioeconomic mechanism, please. Yes. Um, then actually looking at the individual, uh, you have, of course, different realms where actually you operate and where you have aspirations. And a very useful framework is Maslow's Pyramid of Needs, which is really focusing actually on your basic let's say at the base, physiological needs, which is food, which is, uh, for example, uh, water or sheltering, which is mostly driven by economic tools. Uh, then actually, if you go higher, you have social or the ego or your role in the community. And this is actually today mostly political, actually how you position yourself or the group actually bound together in order to get to a certain outcome. And finally, uh, something which is personal, but can be also transcendental through the community is actually happiness and, and uh, spirituality. And uh, what is interesting, if we look at the Corona Y model, and if we take again this gift economy approach, is actually you go really from the top. It is really you start by purpose, then through trust, transparency, humility, you build the community, and the basic needs are actually really addressed later on. 
Um, and what's been really interesting actually over the last three months is that at the end that higher purpose has been addressing a global societal health risks and has been, let's say, the key driver of bringing people together to address that. Let's say each having their little Legos, I would say, to build the solutions. And that in return enabled them to build a network, to have some recognition, to have some learnings. And then actually the other type of mechanism of reciprocity, which are bar term economics, where you expect something in return, or monetary economics, where you expect some kind of, let's say, monetary reward. It's really coming from the bottom up. And what is really interesting, and that's actually what Arta mentioned, is that actually a lot of people have been coming from the top. But some people have been coming from the bottom and we have to really adjust and address those different type of behavior and expectations. You shouldn't put it on the side because eventually Corona Y will need to engage with external actors, which will themselves expect some barter economics or monetary economics. So the ultimate goal is to find a system which can combine all three mechanisms together. Daniel? All right, so we'll take a, a, a quick break, and Marie, if you want, we can check in with people on how the uh, how the experiment went. Great. So I have been hanging out on the uh, interactive exercise sheet. We've had lots of interesting ideas show up. We have not converged back down to a solution, which is so common for us. Uh, does anybody who participated want to give us some feedback on what it felt like to be a part of that, either in voice or in chat? Maybe Agnes? <laughs> yes, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> uh, frankly speaking, this was my first experience. And I, I know people do multi multitasking, right? They sit in a webinar and they do their, their emails. So why don't instead of the emails they actually contribute to the content, which is relevant? This is like a, like there is not, 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 no such thing as a free lunch or the multitasking, but at least there is a relevance because you, your ears are, uh, getting more content which is relevant and that might spark you to think and put another thing in there and I did that and I enjoyed that and I felt how does it work so I encourage everyone <laughs> to try it it's not that you are multitasking a different thing and then listening when your boss is asking questions to you in a <laughs> webinar but <laughs> instead you are simultaneously using that time right, for creativity which is supplementing by the information that is kind of a, um, ubiquitously or uh, omnipresently <laughs> delivered to you. I, I, I think I suggest everyone to, to have that experience. The way you put it makes me really think about how, you know, in when watching a movie or going to a concert, so often there'll be that that hit of inspiration. And it's nice to be able to actually take, take that and, and use it and actually capture it instead of having it fade away. This is, I think this is how our brains work. I mean, if we are left alone, so we are left with our five senses and then some from the internal and then we kind of struggle what, how to prioritize. But now we have this ambience <laughs> and then it kind of a cool, cool, what's the English word? Like when it comes together, con, 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 convergence. Convergence and then there's, well, the other, when the two rivers come together. Confluence. Yeah, confluence. Confluence, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's yeah. the experience. And, and, and riffing on what you're saying there, we've talked about that part about how it's, it's personal and it's about the persons, but part of that is also it's about, it's about us as humans and about how do we actually function. And rather than trying to shoehorn that into an intellectual blueprint of how an organization works, letting our whole human self inform how the organization is structured and comes to be. And, and, and so much more about observation rather than definition, rather than saying, here's how we're going to do it. Just do stuff, be messy, be chaotic, and then periodically look and say, okay, so what's working and why? And yes. be curious and then dive in again. Some of my favorite um, moments in Corona Y have been them real crunch moments where well, you know, we're about to submit for first submission and me and Arta and uh, 10 other people are bouncing between four different documents and and i'm reading other people's work and i'm trying to like clarify and and then and is his comments is like what does this even mean do you, do you mean this and then we have a conversation in there and someone joins in and then someone pops up with like oh i didn't think of it that way and then yeah we this crowdsourced knowledge that six different people looking at it from slightly different points of view and and you end up with better better wording more clear points it's just it ends up much more refined than any individual could put out by themselves what was the most real moment that i've experienced when we had the first submission and we had 30 minutes left before the yeah. deadline and i had to jump in on the call with tyler christine and a couple other people from uh, ty's team 
and I was literally typing stuff and without even understanding it. It was the stream of consciousness of Tyler, Christine, and other people that was directing me to produce knowledge out of the raw data. And that was amazing because I was definitely in some weird, you were, like... You were pretty uh, tired. Yeah, you <laughs> doing it all day long. And, and, and it was in prime examples is like, honestly, like I was like editing images as I went along and copying the links and he was putting them in. And then, then Christine was getting labels for him and, she, and he was just like assembling parts that were just being handed to him that he wasn't even looking at them. He was just like, that goes there, that goes this here. And we got to the end of it. We're like, all of us got to the point. We were like, how did we just do that? I don't know. No, but nobody understood it, but it ended up creating a thing. And it's just one of them. It is. It's like, it's like rather than individual flow, it's group flow when you work like mm -hmm. that. And it's like you bounce mm -hmm. off so many other people. And some of my favorite conversations I've had have been on Zoom with people. I'm just like, we'll start talking about one thing and we'll add something else thing. And somebody will bring an economics idea in and then somebody will talk about ecology. And I'm like, five things have bumped into each other that nobody planned for. And we have this recorded call and then we make summaries of it and we end up with this new discussion point that never existed or a new team starts to get built to look at that problem and it's just it's it's honestly it's how my brain is anyway and it's really lovely to be around other people who are as weird as me that's all i'm gonna say so maybe to kind of give you a kind of a summary of what my my brain interesting brain it also works very interestingly like i just observe and sometimes getting excited about how that can happen i think what you guys are now exposing to the world is how the things which are perceived to be to be managed are um what you do you take the away the artificialness of that right so so the the, the structures and the organizations that have put the artificial layer of the management of the architecture of the different kind of structures so you're kind of removing that and show, and giving the emergence of the human co-creation human kind of um, it's, natural it's management so that, i think it's removing that fictional order that's not order it's fictional it's this, we all just agree that it's order when nobody actually thinks that is any anybody who's worked in any organization can look and it's like oh no this is chaotic we just pretend like it's not chaotic whereas our organization completely embraces the chaos and pretends nothing that it, it, nobody has to. I mean, how many people have you worked with before that have gone and they, they think they have to be because they're the boss, they have to know it or they have to be the expert or they have to know everything. And the, the first the fundamental rule of this place is you, you're wrong more than you're right. And that's fine because everyone's collective wrongs ends up with a better right anyway. And that and nobody has to be the perfect answer. It's just about picking up the ball and carrying it for some, and yeah. somebody picks it up and carries it again, and then somebody else picks it up and carries it again, and collectively we work it out. And time, uh, arrow of time is so important because like the things that we're experiencing is this ultra speed, this coronavirus time, corona Y time. And when, when people observe that, they're very confused because there is no such thing in, you know, in, in the real world. And it's, it's very hard to adapt to it mentally. I'm going to share my screen real quick to share uh, a screenshot from a real commercial organization where I've applied Corona uh, principles in a way. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the guy just says, because I told him that we have to completely redo the thing, and I told him that was a great thing, but two weeks ago. And it's such a radical thought that in typical commercial environment, people are not used to it. The two-week period is just like inexistent uh, timeline for something to, to be removed. Like it takes months for organizations to adapt. So I have a question, more fundamental question. I enjoyed, by the way, the, the, the workshop very much and the, many of the ideas, the, the, whole, the whole thought of unmanagement was very intriguing to me. Uh, and perhaps you mentioned this before. So how does this work? Is this a system you have created? Is this a platform that you have created? Is this a consulting service you're doing? Uh, I mean, what is the business model uh, you know that sort of or is this just a voluntary project what's going on here i'm trying to figure that out um, one one of the things that i think can be maddening. <laughs> one of the things that i think can be can be maddening at first glance in terms of the unmanagement process is that because it's all mission rather than project driven um it means that when you ask a question like that the answer is like yes and yes and yes and we don't know 
um, that we are in the process or, of organically figuring that out. So soon, it's not up yet, but watch the space, um, unmanaged.org. Um, is a place where we're going to be trying to collect some of the thoughts and the practices and some of the pieces that we're we're gathering around this. Um, but most likely the whatever the unmanagement organization in addition to Corona Y ends up being will itself be unmanaged. So it'll be the people who show up and who are passionate about it and who are interested in defining what it is and figuring out how that works, um, who will figure out the answers to, to the very good questions that you're asking. Are you doing this part time? What is the business model? Are you doing this? We have it's, there's, there, is no, there is no business model right now in the sense that business models require on like economic flow. We have no economic flow of any description. We uh, don't exist within that sort of stereotypical space. The way I look, that where I, one of my points I'd like to put across, and one of the ways we've been discussing in the group that I really like the idea of um, a cooperative. A cooperative is a shared owned organization or system and the idea then is everyone would have equal share if they sign on to be a part of the membership and your only requirement is is to contribute to the conversation contribute to the, the work contribute in whichever way that feels useful and helpful and we end up with something that looks like a business and a political party and a charity and a city and none of them at the same time because we don't really know what it is at any one point and I think I think I want to take us back to Derek's slide here because I think that part of it is that we approach things backwards from I mean typically with a business plan the questions you're asking are, are the starting point like okay like what's the business plan how are you monetizing this how do you make this sustainable um, and that with unmanagement those at least for an organization like Corona Y those end up being the last questions that we're actually looking at. We start from the overall mission and aims. We then work to be building the things which are actually useful, which we've had we've had good success at. We've had a lot of tools that are beginning to come out uh, that are that are exciting to some of the epidemiologists and virologists that we're talking to. And then the final step is then figuring out, okay, how do we now make what this organization is doing into something that's a sustainable, monetizable piece? But with that monetization side also um, is it's necessary for sustaining, but otherwise it's incidental. So the goal isn't to maximize profit in our case, but it's to maximize the impact. Um, and, and so the whole way that that unfolds ends up being quite different. So maybe to yeah, summarize too. what Prashant for you, uh, because I, 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 I kind of can feel what the academic with a longstanding experience in the managerial science and with the IT background is currently thinking and asking this question. So as I'm being in a, in, in, in kind of both campuses at the same time, I can try to translate to you. So the answer is there is no business model. <laughs> so that's the, <laughs> that's the answer. And the second thing is there possibly is an emergence of a model which is novel and unique, but is very fundamentally rooted in who we really are as a human beings. And we are taking away some of the burden and some of the difficulties that have emerged during our industrial revolution and technological evolution. And now we're kind of not like really reinvent or give the rebirth of the natural management of run by the human deep values like trust, <laughs> like co-creation and, and spontaneity and those kind of things. So answer currently there is no business model, but possibly there will be a model to this to this world which is unseen before and would be much more effective than any of the manage, manage, managerial models that we currently have. And, and maybe if I may, if I may, I would add that actually uh, it's really going into the trend of impact investing, where investors, new generations and others are thinking about financial returns, but also social and environmental returns. So a triple bottom line approach. And what actually Karan Hawaii is offering is actually a deal flow of solutions. And the outcomes are the solutions, be it the data, be it the tools. And those might engage existing, let's say, actors, investors, and business models might be developed for each of those, a combination of those, and then come back to the cooperative, let's say, concept that actually Tyler mentioned. And if you combine that to blockchain, for example, you can really decentralize it in a way which is highly powerful. So what might happen is actually maybe in six months time, we might have actually a highly dynamic and profitable model which could reinvest into the community to not only address a health challenge, but maybe go to a climate one or to a social one, but it oh, would science. be complementary to what traditional actors are doing today.
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And th this is actually how we've been ideating of becoming this kind of a launch pad to launch these exciting rockets into the space. Uh, so someone comes to us with a payload, be it, you know, uh, transforming how the, I don't know, uh, toothbrushes are made to make them fully recyclable. We take that idea and tell them, hey, here are people that can help you. Here are resources, here is supplies and all of these things. Uh, you can build your rocket here and we'll help you launch it. We'll also bring some fuel and funding if that is something that is required to push against the external forces, the gravity of the world. And here you go. And you launch it to the orbit, you bring the payload to the orbit. So we become this kind of a collection of, uh, of things, of rockets, big ideas, impactful things to be delivered to our future, our collective future. One of the pieces also related to that, because there's discussion, there is ongoing discussion beginning around business model and around like, how do we make things sustainable? Um, but a piece of that is because it's all self-organizing and people choose which things they're focusing on. It really is now where, as we, as we get to a point where we have to have that discussion, uh, it's much easier for anyone who wants to, to dive into that discussion and help make it. So we have some people who can be working on incorporation and other people who are working on figuring out, you know, what, what is that model of kind of that, the launchpad model I was talking about, et cetera. So as, an, as new challenges become dominant on the horizon of the organization and enter into sort of our group consciousness, then groups of people sort of organize around them. It's, it's kind of like ants organizing around a food source when they find it. Once we find the problem, we run towards it and then and then people try to figure out how do we break that down and turn it into something or other. Yeah, and the point that Tyler is making, I'd rather be part of the solution than rich and part of the problem. I 100% I resonate with that. And I was telling my wife the other day that if there is a way to bring the impact and change the world without being wealthy, I'm going to take it. And I think that a lot of people naturally actually gravitate towards that. But unfortunately, you know, the way how industrial revolution happened, the only way to make an impact is through the as a byproduct of a financial activity. Those are very noble, noble goals, you know. I'm impressed. And, and, and I think that there's there's ways that that can be extremely effective and successful. I'm, I'm, I'll move us on to the bringing it home piece just because I want us to have time for that. But there's so much rich conversation on exactly this topic that, that um, I would love for us to have more of. Um, but Marie, I'll turn things over to you for bringing it home. I'm always sure. for more conversation. So, uh... Uh, recognizing that there was a chance we might run out of time, which we have, we cleverly designed this particular final exercise as one that can be a take-home test if you prefer. Uh, if you go back to our initial document of links, in there, there is a table that takes you to a discussion document for each of the challenges that we have talked about, as well as one for other challenges. What we'd like you to do is to think about unmanagement principles and think about how could these be applied to organizations that you're already working in. So uh, what, what you'll do is you'll dump, jump to your discussion document and there there's a link to a Google form. That Google form will kind of walk you through the steps of thinking through how to apply uh, these principles to this particular problem uh, in your home organization. Uh, it is anonymous, however, it is not private. And so uh, please don't uh, put your boss's name in the sheets or anything. Uh, we, we, there is a, uh, a link to the results that you guys all can look at. We look forward to looking at those and learning about learning from them from you, but we are going to just uh, make that an exercise for the reader, let you guys go ahead and do that work. And we will bring it back to just a minute or two of conversation before we're done here. So back to Daniel. I'll, I'll actually add up on this bring at home exercise because it may sound way too radical, way too crazy to be applied in commercial environment. But guess what? I, I tried it during this Corona Y time because, you know, 95% of my time was focused on Corona Y and I couldn't manage my commercial activity. So I actually started applying this decentralization uh, aspect of it because I couldn't manage all the people in, in private companies. And I just started, you know, bringing people together, letting them solve the problems, bugs, you know, all of these things for the purpose of the company. And the only difference was that people were paid for the work, but it worked in some magical way. I'm not even aware of like which bugs exist or which bugs are fixed. I'm no longer a manager. 
and and similarly in in uh, in my work in my own company, Corona Y has utterly transformed how I think about it, and I'm really looking at how we can apply as much of the Corona Y principles, the unmanagement principles, as possible. There, it's also impacting new organizations that are founding, and even just projects that given organizations are taking on. Um, so I think that as we continue to move forward with defining, understanding, and mainly experimenting with with what unmanagement is. Um, will be finding that it is something that has a lot of different ways that it can be sustainable and profitable, not necessarily in the way that makes the CEO of an organization trillions of dollars, but in terms of sustainability and where we're at as a species and what we need next, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, yeah, and I, I also found when I was uh, when I was a telecom executive and I was actually applying this within my or organization, I found that uh, it's the kind of thing that a CEO is going to like because the productivity and quality of work is so much better when you allow all contributions to be a part of your results than when you limit them. That that's uh, that's a huge uh, competitive advantage. And we're going to move just generally into a question and answer period now. I'm not sure. I, I think we're kind of out of time. I'm not sure how much wiggle room there is on that. But if there's any time for question and answer, this is when it is. So in, informal discussion is here. I think the only limitation is for those who are willing to join the next session, which will start in about 30 minutes. But those who are willing to stay in the room, the room is still open and you can continue as long as everybody wants. This is the kind of a official end. But you know, in a real conference, the people stay in the room and talk, right? So we can do the same thing. And the next session will start in, in about 30 minutes. So I'll ask you, a, not a question, but a request. Where can I learn more about it? Can you send me a link or something? Uh, or Agnes can send if, so you can if, send only, it. If, if only we had a concentrated, summarized version of the chaos that is Corona Y. I mean, when, once we've got one. <laughs> We, we are beginning to work on it. We're, we're just beginning to work now on some papers that we're hoping to put out, as well as some blog series and other things to try to, to explain more of these principles and, and how they how they play out. Um, but but we're, we're just in the early stages of bringing all of that together. So we can we can send you some information. Please feel free to be in touch with us and we can we can answer specific questions. And that dialogue could actually form a wonderful seed for some of that information aggregating, because mm -hmm. the kinds of questions you're asking are exactly the kind that we need to be answering and finding the ways to answer appropriately. That's my email address, uh, but Agnes can give it to you too. Yeah, I will I will right now send you the basic entry point, which is coronaY.org, and then I will connect the, the people like with your emails just right now. I will do that. You will be connected That's through great. the emails. Sounds good. That's great. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing more about it. Thank you very much for everyone's input. You've all been amazing, as always. Um, I'm, I'm just, I feel very lucky to just hang around with you guys and talk to you more. It's just, it's like highlight of my day some days. Likewise, that's great. Agnes, I wanted to just quickly, and then let's take general, general conversation. Thanks, Charles. Um, but when you were talking about that move to just ge to, to sort of that human focused side and just what we naturally are as people and how organizations stem from that, the image that came overwhelmingly to me is of a hermit crab. And I feel like, um, you know, a hermit crab finds the shell that's the right size for it at a given time, and then eventually it outgrows, outgrows it. And the terrifying part is then when it has to leave the shell, be vulnerable, um, and find something new to fit into. And I think as a species, we're really that in terms of how we deal with organization. We have some amazing things. When we first, you know, when we were um, codifying laws on clay tablets, there was some really neat stuff we were figuring out about how groups organize. Um, and the tools we have and the capabilities we have to do some of that organization have changed since the time of Hammurabi. And we're still operating under a, a slow aggregation of some of that, those principles, and it sort of has calcified into that shell that maybe we're beginning to outgrow. And maybe we now have access to new tools, new uh, new options for how to do it. We're still the same humans, but we now have new options for how we do that organizational side. And I think on management is one attempt to come out of that a normal, normal shell that we're outgrowing and find what else is out there. Thank you so much. I like that. I like that. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. When you went hermit crab, I'm like, where is he going with this? 
Where is he going? <laughs> I, 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 did, I did see those crabs and I, I saw how they kind of go around with a different kind of stuff on their back. And not, it's not always from nature made, but sometimes from human made stuff. They'll yeah. find they're living <laughs> various kind of things. <laughs> Were there any questions or, or comments that people, especially those of us who haven't been presenting, have that they would like to, to bring in or bring up? Mics are open if you want them. All right. I, I think I think we are good. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. I agree. I would say that um, there were so many times when I felt that I, you know, kind of dumped lots of knowledge and people and there was just silence. So that that is some behavior that I learned to be acceptable. That's why I'm pretty sure people will have lots of questions, but those will ha happen asynchronously when they will be, you know, sleeping or in the shower and just thinking, how can we unmanage our own organizations? How can we achieve something as enjoyable as these guys are are having in that Corona uh, environment? How do we, you know, transform something that is boring and something that is just all about money into something that has meaning, has impact? And those are key things that you can't just like, you know, all of a sudden, just like on, on the Q&A session, ask, because you have to digest that information, you have to absorb it, you have to bump into enough interactions with the external world to produce something internally and basically formulate that vision, that objective function for yourself and suggest one for organization. Because... Don't, don't be afraid that the objective function that you imagine will be different with the one that uh, your organization has. Because guess what? The, the world is limitless. There, there are so many opportunities out there. And if you don't fit the objective function of your organization, I'm sure there are some people in organization that share your values and principles that you can work together and formulate you know, your own team within that company. So the, the world is your playground. And I think I think a couple of things that pop to mind there. So as as people do that digestion and and think about, uh, you may have further questions, you may have ideas. Um, for all the people who are presenting, you know, our LinkedIn is there on the slide presentation. That document will, will be accessible to you in perpetuity. Feel free to reach out to anybody if you have further questions that you have or want to discuss things. Um, or if you want to see how this actually works in practice, um, come by coronawai.org join you'll find very quickly you'll be right in the thick of things um, and it's a great chance to um, especially if it's an organization you've had nothing to do with right now um, to come in boldly come in and experiment with like okay is, is it really working that way can i come in and and come up with all kinds of different ideas of how things can go and and what happens if i do that um, so i would say come and explore and experiment and as, as long as you're not actively you know lobbing smoke bombs into the work that other people are doing you'll find that you're welcomed in um and, and people will be really curious to hear what you have to say all right i i need to be in another session presenting some of my co-authored papers so i want to say thank you so much and this was a pleasure to see the evolution because I've been in touch with you guys for uh, quite a while and I see how the things evolve and I'm enjoying that and I'm enjoying how some of you just say that it's the biggest smile you ever had like, like today and this this is how the human nature is speaking through the instincts and it just says it as opposite to the some of the people some of the feelings that people experience in their corporate jobs so <laughs> we're good. Sure. <laughs> thank you to you Agnes and to Prashant yeah, this uh, and, and, and working just... day in Corona can be 14 hours long because I'll be reading things <laughs> all day long. And it's a working day that I'm literally spending the majority of it just learning new interesting things. 
and that's I've always loved learning so I'm just literally around people throwing new ideas at me that I've not found yet and that's great I'll go learn more great keep I'm just yeah. we're, I just we're need to work out to make it sustainable <laughs> I just need to work out yeah, to make yeah. this as like I can pay my bills with just learning stuff I, I, I do that all day long man Yep. And, and before we close down formally, just to say, Agnes, to you and to Prashant and to Jitma, um, just appreciation for the opportunity to, uh, to, to present here and for, to, to you, Agnes, for the ongoing discussions that we've been having with you. They've been a real, a real help in, in how we formulate as well. With pleasure. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, right. for coming. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks for the thank you guys. As well. We've got a decent amount of Corona Y people. Yeah. See you later. Okay, we'll be in touch. <laughs>